Welcome back to another episode on Postgres. In previous episodes, we learned how to run Postgres in a container. We learned the important tasks of configuring Postgres, as well as set up streaming replication to run a primary and a secondary instance for standby. And we learned how to fail over to the standby instance in case of failure. Today, we're gonna to take everything we've learned so far and learn how to run a Postgres database in a Kubernetes cluster. Now, Postgres by default is not built for Kubernetes and Kubernetes can be pretty brutal when running stateful workloads. And this will make for an interesting topic. So without further ado, let's go. So if you take a look at my GitHub repo, I have a storage folder and in the storage folder, I have a databases folder with a Postgres folder. And in here, I have my introduction to Postgres, which is how to run Postgres in a Docker container, how to configure Postgres and all the configuration options, and then how to do replications to run two containers, one as a primary and one as a secondary. And then we have today's demo, which is the Kubernetes basic guide. And here's a readme. And this is how to run Postgres in Kubernetes as a basic instance for development and testing purposes. We're gonna go through the challenges, create a Kubernetes cluster, and follow all the steps of setting up Postgres and Kubernetes. So be sure to check out the link down below to the source code so you can follow along. The first thing we talk about in our readme is the challenges of running stateful workloads in Kubernetes. Now, oftentimes I get a lot of people asking for help when they try to run databases and complex databases inside of Kubernetes, when they do not have experience about how to set up replication and availability for databases, as well as lacking Kubernetes experience, which is all a big no-no. If you're planning to run Postgres with high availability, check out my guide on replication. In this video, we'll not be using Postgres controllers or operators or Helm charts, because these open source tools assume that you have a full understanding of databases. If you need to learn a little bit more about Kubernetes stateful sets, check out my guide on stateful sets. If something goes wrong and you're using things like operators and controllers to deploy high available Postgres instances, you will not know how to troubleshoot it because you don't have the basic understanding of Postgres to begin with, and you will lose data. So in this video, we'll take a look at what we learned about the basics of Postgres and use vanilla constructs for Kubernetes like pods, config maps, stateful sets, secrets, and build up a Postgres instance. This will be great for dev and testing purposes, but for production, you'll need replication. And in the next video, we'll set up a primary instance with replication failover. So here I did a small write-up about the challenges of running in Kubernetes. But one other thing to notice is when running in Kubernetes, how will you manage cluster upgrades? When you're running Kubernetes in the cloud like EKS or AKS, the cloud provider and the way they do upgrades sometimes is they do rolling node upgrades. So they delete old nodes and roll out new ones. So if you don't have a strategy in place for that, you will lose data. With that aside, the first thing we're going to need to do is create a Kubernetes cluster. And in this demo, I'd like to use a utility called Kind. Kind is a very neat way to run Kubernetes clusters in lightweight throwaway Docker containers. So you can create clusters on the fly and delete them when you're done. It's a really neat and quick way to get Kubernetes clusters up and running for testing. So to create my cluster, I'm going to say Kind Create Cluster. I'm going to call my Kubernetes cluster Postgres and I'm going to run Kubernetes 1.28. So I go ahead and run that and that will spit up a lightweight Kubernetes cluster that we can use for testing. And now with all of that done, I can say kubectl get nodes and we can see my Kubernetes cluster is ready to go. And next up, we'll set up a namespace to group all our resources together. And to do that, it's very simple. I say kubectl create ns and I'm going to create a namespace called PostgreSQL. So I go ahead and run that. That'll create our namespace and we can place all our resources in there. Now in chapter one, two and three of our Postgres guide in Docker, we learned how to build up a Docker run command. And when we did that, we noticed a few sensitive values that need to go as a secret. And we used an environment variable for that. In Kubernetes, we'll use a secret to store these values. These are the Postgres user, the password, we'll put a default Postgres database name, the replication user that we'll be using in the future, as well as the replication password that we'll be using. This is the replication credentials that we'll use for our standby instance later in the next guide. So to create the secret, all I do is say, Q 
kubectl minus n because I want to put that secret in the Postgres namespace. I say create secret generic. I give it a name. And here I say from literal. And I'm just going to put all the values for this demo inside of these environment variables. So I go ahead and copy that. And then I paste it to the terminal. And that'll create our new Postgres secret. Now the secret is just for the sensitive data. To configure Postgres, we'll use a config map. Now to run a Postgres instance, we'll need to know what is a good Kubernetes construct to use. We can't just use a pod because we know if a pod dies, our data will be gone. Although pods can be really good if you just need a Postgres instance up and running for a quick integration test. We can't use a deployment because we don't want to run a pod on a random node. But again, deployments can be really good for testing purpose if you just want to get a Postgres instance up and running quickly for a test. We will want a pod that will stick to a specific node where the data is and potentially never move. We also want our pod to be individually addressable when it's load balanced because in the future video when looking at replication we're going to need to individually address each pod. For this we'll need a stateful set. Now stateful set is a workload API object used to manage stateful applications. Now if you want to learn more about stateful sets be sure to check out my guide on stateful sets. Now in this video if we scroll down we can see here is an example of a stateful set. So they have a service and the service is of cluster IP none, which means each pod will get its own DNS name with an ordinal so it can be individually addressable. And then we have a stateful set example. And here they're just using an Nginx image as a test. And then they have volumes and volume claim templates to set up persistence for that stateful set instance. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and copied the stateful set example. And in my guide, under the storage database Postgres part four folder, I've created a YAML folder. And in there, I created a stateful set.yaml. And then there are some minor changes that I have done. I've replaced wherever I found Nginx, I replaced it with Postgres. I made some changes to the service and some minor changes to the stateful set, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And then I've gone ahead and added the environment variables and the secret mappings. And I've created a config map. A config map is where we will configure our Postgres instance. So all the Postgres config we learned in part two will be in a config map and the sensitive environment variables will be in a secret. So let's go ahead and take a look at that YAML file. So there are three things in this YAML file. The first thing is a config map. The config map has the HBA conf, the Postgres conf, and these are the Postgres configuration files that we've taken a look at in part one and two of our Postgres guide. And I basically grab these. If we take a look at our GitHub repo storage database Postgres in the part one, two, and three folder, I basically went to part Part two, the config, and I copied out the HBA conf and the Postgres conf from this, and then I pasted them into my config map. And if we take a look at the HBA conf, there's not much of importance here for running a basic Postgres instance. More of this will be in the next video when we set up replication, things like the replication user and the access for replication. The most important one is the Postgres SQL conf file, as this is the main configuration file for Postgres. And this one is basically where Postgres needs to store its data. Where is the HBA file, the access configuration file, the ident file, the port, which Postgres will use to listen on, and all the settings we've discussed in part two of our Postgres guide. You can see in this guide, I've also gone ahead and copied out the replication settings just for now. So we'll have them ready to go in the next video. The second YAML piece I wanna discuss is the service, the Kubernetes service. And this is a basic Kubernetes service that exposes our pods. And the important thing to notice here is the ports we're going to be using. So we're gonna forward the Postgres port we identified in the config file and forward it to the target port which will be exposed on the pod and the most important piece here is the cluster IP we're going to set it to none this means that when we run a Postgres instance instead of getting a random pod name we'll get a Postgres as the pod name and then dash and the ordinal of the pod so we'll get Postgres dash zero dash one dash two and they will always point to the same pod so they're individually addressable and this will help us in the next video when we set up replication so the pods can actually talk to one another. And the final piece to talk about here is the stateful set. This is the bread and butter of our Postgres instance. We're going to call this one Postgres. 
I'm going to run one replica as this is the basic introduction guide. And firstly, let's cover the main container. So we run the Postgres container. In this demo, we run Postgres 15. We tell Postgres where to find the configuration file when it starts up. This is the same setting and very important that we discovered in our part two series when learning about Postgres and Docker. Then we expose the port, which is the port that Postgres will listen on. It's configured in our Postgres conf. Then we have the important PG data environment variable. Remember that Postgres reads this environment variable first when it initializes its data directory before it actually reads the configuration file. Then we have our secret mappings. So we're going to have the Postgres user here and the Postgres password, these environment variables that are picked up from our secret we deployed earlier, as well as the default Postgres database name. And then we have a few volume mounts that I'd like to talk about first. The first one is the config, which is just mounting basically the config map we, we looked at earlier. And then we have the data. Now this is the data directory where we're going to be storing our data. We're going to mount this into the pod and on the outside we're going to use a volume claim template and we're just going to be using the standard storage class name that's available on my cluster. So if you're running an AKS or EKS you would have a storage plugin potentially something like an SSD disk or some sort of disk volume that your cloud provider will attach to each node. It's very important to understand how volume claim templates work in the case of a failure of the node, your pod may lose its data. And that's where replication will help because we can fail over to another pod and we can recover our main primary instance later. And then the last piece here, I'm just gonna request a hundred megabyte of storage from the persistent volume. If you need to learn more about persistent volumes, check out my persistent volume guide. So to deploy our Postgres instance, all we need to do is apply the YAML file. So we say kubectl in the Postgres namespace, apply, and we apply the part four basic YAML stateful set.yaml file that we just taken a look at. So I go ahead and paste that, and that will deploy our config map. It'll create our stateful set as well as the service to expose the pods. And if I do kubectl get pods, you can see our pod is starting up and the initialization container is running first. And then in a few seconds, we can see now our pod is running and ready to go. Now you're probably wondering why we have an init container. Now with databases and many IT workloads, we often have to go and set up and provision and configure things before our application can start. For example, for databases, we may have to go create some directories, or we may need to set up some tables or user permissions. Some of these things can live in the container, but sometimes it's out of our control. In my red this guide, I had a similar thing where I had to figure out where the latest master node of this Redis instance is before my pod actually starts. So my pod could register with the master. Now this is where init containers come in. Init containers help us run some arbitrary work before the main container in the pod starts. So in our example for Redis, when our pod is about to start, we had an init container that figured out from the Sentinel where's the latest master so that it can register the pod that's about to start with the cluster. In our case, we're going to use an init container to set up an archive directory for our Postgres instance. The archive folder, remember, is where it will write data integrity files. It's going to archive the data to disk to protect data integrity. We'll use this concept for replication in the next video. So you'll notice when looking at our stateful set here that we have minimized here an init container. So this is just a small container. I could probably use an Alpine container to do this but what I'm doing here is I'm just creating an archive directory so in the volume that we're going to create as part of the volume claim we create an archive folder and we pass ownership to the user in the container to that archive folder so when our Postgres instance starts up the archive directory will be available and the archive directory has been configured in the config file this has been configured here in our replication settings under data slash archive now to go ahead and check our install we can run a few commands the first command we're going to do is kubectl get pods, make sure our pod is running and good to go. The next command is the kubectl logs command on that pod to get the logs to make sure there's no errors in the logs and everything looks good and it's up and running. So we can see our database is all good. We can also go ahead and check our persistence. So what we can do is we can go and 
inside the pod, say kubectl exec and just run bash and we're now inside the pod. We can check our data directory exists as well as our archive exists as well. You can see it's writing the archive just like it did in our previous videos. I can also go ahead and log into Postgres. Go ahead and log in. We can see our admin user is there. Go ahead and create a new table, show the table and now we can quit out of Postgres and exit out of the pod. I can then do get pods and let's try to delete this pod. So I say kubectl delete pod, go ahead and delete that pod and we'll notice a new one has started up. To test our replication, we go ahead and exec into that one. We log back into Postgres and moment of truth. We look at the tables and we can see our table still exists. So that means our data is persisted. And whenever our pod dies, the stateful set will ensure that the pod starts on the node where the volume is. So now we've successfully deployed everything we've learned from chapter one and two and parts of chapter three into a Kubernetes cluster. In the next video, we'll take a look at what we've learned learned in chapter 3 about replication and apply those studies to Kubernetes. And you'll notice more of the challenges of running stateful workloads in Kubernetes and how to overcome them. There is still so much to learn, so if you like the video be sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell so you're notified of when I upload next. If you want to support the channel even further be sure to check the Patreon link down below or hit the join button to become a YouTube member. And as always, thanks for watching and until next time, peace.